Let's hear more about the prodigal nature of God's grace today. The prodigal is part two of two. Again, we got the prodigal son and the prodigal father. We have the prodigality of both. One is more extravagant, wasteful, and, you know, throws his stuff away. And then there's a father who's extravagant and wasteful and throws his mercy all over us. We're going to pick up at the middle of the story, right where, just about where we left off last week. Let's hear the good news, an old, old tale. Let's hear it in fresh new ways. But when he, the lost son, came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? And here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Cutting family ties here. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So I love these pictures. He set off and went to his father, but while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. The young man, see, has not even said a word. But then the man says to him, the young man, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Stop right there. The father said to his slaves, quickly, Bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves. The Greek word is also servants. We're not sure that they were slaves. Let's be, let's be honest about this. He called one of the servants and asked what was going on. The servant replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you. The word slave and servant are interchangeable in Greek. But really the word here is better translated like like a slave for you. And I have never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours, this son of yours, came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Hear what the Spirit is saying to us, the church. In these words, direct quotes from Jesus, according to Luke's Gospel, Jesus speaking to the Pharisees. Would you pray with me? Listen to the one whose word is spoken. Listen to the one who is close at hand. Listen to the voice behind creation. Listen even if you can't understand. Let us listen. Amen. And today's message is indeed offering home. Doug, you can drop. Thanks. Last Sunday in part one of this familiar tale, 
We trace the prodigal mercy of the father in this story. Prodigal, again, definition, lavish, extravagant, wasteful. The father who creates a village scandal by running to welcome his prodigal home and doing it without demanding, without allowing a word from his, his disgraced son to interject. Today, we hear of the impact of the sudden homecoming of the younger sibling on the older, dutiful, homebound brother. Today, we hear of the threat to all this prodigality, the threat to abundant and wasteful mercy in the person of the older brother who's been living out in peace and in seeming prosperity his zero-sum game. This good and great steward, tending the property and the traditional values, saving for his retirement, nothing wrong with that. I don't know about you, but I resemble that remark. Many of us I know may identify with this brother who causes each of us to pause and to ask ourselves, do we really want to sign on to such a prodigal God in this story anyhow? It seems that Jesus does not leave us much choice. For not only does Jesus portray to his Pharisee audience a God who runs to welcome the returning dissolute in the two parables immediately before this one, the lost coin and the lost sheep, Jesus portrays God actively seeking what is lost. Not simply a God who runs to welcome the prodigal when he comes home, but seeks the lost sheep, seeks the lost Coin. Our God, who seems to be one hot mess of wasteful grace and munificent mercy. For me, that is not the God I heard about or experienced not a lot growing up in the Presbyterian church where I grew up. The church that structured every liturgy and committee to the bullet point. The church where when I was baptized at confirmation, for I had not been baptized before, I can remember the pastor laying two moist fingers on my forehead. I can still barely feel it to this day. That was kind of symbolic of this. I felt looking back on a kind of a parsimonious Presbyterian upbringing. Either way, it seems we don't have much choice if we wish to be faithful, even though this may or may not be your experience. Either way, we do not have much choice but to sign on to God's prodigality in our lives. Jesus teaches us in the parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. God's prodigality to live abundantly to pay it forward. As a friend of mine says, to give until it feels good. And so given no choice, how then are we to follow to our prodigal God's example today? Not each of us individually. Luke wasn't writing here to particular individuals but he was writing to a faith community as a church. So how are we actively to seek the lost, if you will, brazenly welcoming them? How are we, as the sermon title has it today, offering home? I scratched the rest of my sermon, much of it yesterday, after I saw what happened. And I played it out a little bit last week what I thought might happen. Here at Bethesda Presbyterian, one simple way we have of offering home or an idea of home is opening wide our sanctuary doors, the bell tower, the uh, ramp door from eight to six on Saturday and next week as well on Sunday. 
Of course, they're already open Sunday morning, right? But we'll have a volunteer out there early in the morning. Now, I sat in the back now where Doug is sitting, the tech, the tech man. And I was sat there for the first four hours yesterday. And, and at noon, Ron came and relieved me. And I, we actually had the Bible study. We usually had at 10 a.m. and did it on Zoom from here, my part. But then Ron and Pat Jackson followed and they brought projects they had with them. I think, Ron, you got some old archives from the church and you were doing projects and, you know, we can bring whatever projects we have. We have a comfortable chair there now, the comfy chair sitting back there. And with coffee, of course, in the narthex. And Doug, if you put up the slide, put up the slide. Just give you three visuals of yesterday, actually four. There's Ron with the door. We got the welcome banner and Pat showed me how to just tie the welcome banner out there and tie it with a mask. Duh, you can stab it so it doesn't blow over. And then we have the uh, candles there in the middle of the sanctuary. And I wanna tell you in a moment about some of the people who walked in. Just a general description. Everything's anonymous, of course. And then the following slide. There's what the marquee looks like. And there's our beautiful sanctuary. Thank you, Doug. And there will be people at the door even as the National Philharmonic comes in. So it will be here for the National Philharmonic. And, and, and uh, I don't think we'll have people come by today because of what Ron and Pat did yesterday it was so intentional and so good. And I want to share a little bit about that. Now, not many showed up off the street when I was sitting there the first four hours yesterday. This open house of sorts is brand new. But once Ron and Pat came, I hear we got a few visitors. I heard we have a, a young fellow from a country in Africa who lost a close family member. He's from this area, and he's thinking about setting up a church in his home country, which I believe his father or grandfather was trying to get going there. He came in here and prayed. Another, a woman looking for the AA meeting. I think we're gonna get that a lot. People walking in and around to the Delray Club where we have all the 40 or 50 meetings a week here. And as she was being led to the Delray Club in the direction, she was just looking for the meeting. She saw the door open, she came in. She looked around and said, what a gorgeous sanctuary. And then she went into the meeting. That's the one person I saw that came in, a letter to the meeting. Another AA member popped by after the meeting. Another one came by looking for worship, which was really across the street. But we were here and we could tell them where it was. And then there was a young man struggling with a marijuana addiction. Can I meditate here, I'm told he asked. And Pat shared with me, he stayed in the sanctuary for 40 minutes. They had a chat on his way out. Here in this prodigious place, and it is prodigious, whence we get the word prodigal. Here to offer the space and place to experience prodigal, God's prodigal mercy. We feel the wind coming in right now. Is it the wind? Wow. <laughs> Hear the spirit. To those who may feel lost and are looking to be found, they can simply come here. Now, if you can volunteer a couple of hours, great. We would love to have you. Ron's got the spreadsheet made all out. We've got people to cover the next couple of weeks. Our new friend, uh, Kate, who's not here with us today. Many of you, particularly on Zoom, do not know Kate. She's been with us for three Sundays. She lives down the block in Triangle Towers, where Vicki used to live when she first moved here. Kate said, I'll volunteer. It's great. She's volunteering a couple of hours. If you have a project to bring with you, Saturday or Sunday, come. We have it covered the next couple of weeks, but this is the beginning, in a way, of opening our doors. How many people have been inside this beautiful sanctuary? How many people have heard the acoustics like we heard with the beautiful anthem we heard and we'll hear with the National Philharmonic today? How many people have simply heard the acoustics of themselves breathing?
and we are getting better and better at the logistics at this. And we've gotten some great suggestions already. The logistics. We're really good at logistics. And really the older son in the story has a lot going for him. But this is not something the older son in the story probably would have thought of. I think it was you, Ev Garris, that first mentioned it. This is new for our church. This is new for any Presbyterian church I've known. This is new to the point we put pictures on the Facebook page, our Facebook page, and two of our former, former clergy staff, Stephanie Crosby and Dan Christian said, this is wonderful. This is amazing. The sanctuary looks great. Thanks for doing this. And I had two other colleagues says, maybe we can do this in our church as well. As people unfurl and unfold themselves out of the pandemic, can you imagine the experience people are looking for just like this? A place, a space that's safe, that may feel like offering home, that we can do it in a responsible and yet prodigal way. It'd be amazing. You may wish to come by too on a Saturday or Sunday. The Pharisees were a progressive religious lot. They're not often presented that way. They were the church reformers of that day. And Jesus was most likely connected to them, probably one of them. I truly believe with the scholars that he was one of them. And that's the reason he went at them so hard. And he went at them hard and he goes hard at us, the faithful religious reformers today, because we are the ones ever careful to circumscribe to rally the wagons, to go like the older brother into homeland security mode. Homeland security mode. Faced with the prospects of something odd and unwieldy like this. Homeland security mode. That is the true God of our world today. I'm convinced. It's not freedom from fear. It's security through fear. Homeland security, economic security, national security, security. Security is great but it's not God. It's good, but it's not God. The true God of our nation, shutting out refugees, putting up walls. And the true God of any institutional church culture in which we have all lived and moved and had our very being. And I'm just thankful that this idea is coming up and taking root. Thankful to Ron and Pat and George who's volunteered and Kate who's volunteered and others to be here. Ev and Ed will be here next week. And I look back and I say to myself, Chuck, when you were, God help me if somebody wanders in solo who I've never met in a time other than worship. God help me that anyone asks for the bathroom, I have to about worry about them wandering on the property. That's always going to be a concern, right? You never knew it was going to come in off the street. But then I thought, God help you, Chuck, Chuck, to simply trust our volunteers as we make this happen. Trust ourselves with our God-given intuition about what to do next. This will take into intuitive powers we may not have tapped into about what to discern, to discern in a new way, how to be safe at the same time, how to be prodigal. This is offering home to our community. By our sheer presence and a lavish abundant sanctuary in a lavish, abundant way. To seek out the lost. A massive sanctuary, cheek by jowl now with downtown, uptown, boomtown, Bethesda, the purple lines coming through anytime. 
continuing in this gorgeous springtime to come to unfurl and uh, unfurl and unfold and offer our volunteer hours as a living sacrifice to those who do we do not and maybe will not ever walk in this sanctuary again especially during Sunday hour. Living into this parable today by stating to the world entire that the offering the joy of coming home takes priority over everything else. Offering the joy of coming home takes priority over everything else.